Hey, what's up my dudes? Devayorn here, bringing you part 4 of our Divine Spellcasting Guide series. In this video, we're going to be talking about every spell available to clerics, druids, and shamans at level 4, including those added from Icewind Dale through the Sword Coast Stratagems mod. Now, just a couple quick caveats before we get started. We do play with a set of rules. First rule is that we play hardcore, no save, no reload, so if the main character dies, it's game over, back to Baldur's Gate 1. Two, we play an insane difficulty, so everyone in the party is taking double damage. And finally, Excuse me, we have SCS installed and its components maximized, which means any enemy that's eligible for HLAs will have them. Clerics and Wizards will cast a variety of spells instantly at the start of combat to simulate pre-battle casting. And all high-level magical creatures will have a variety of nasty tools and abilities to play with to make the game much more challenging and much more fun. Now, everything I say is going to be in regards to those particular set of rules. However, 99% of what I say will apply to your core rules, unmodded runs as well. Now we do have a tier list set up for the spells. S tier is spells that are awesome. You should take these and use them all the time because they're amazing. A tier spells are spells that are situationally awesome or generally good. B tier spells are spells that are situationally pretty good or okay. C tier spells are spells that you really shouldn't ever be taking unless you have nothing else that you could be taking. And RP tier spells are spells that obviously stand for role playing to where unless you're actively role playing, you really should never be taking or using this spell. I'll also highlight the differences for the uh, Icewind Dale spells. Some of them have been tweaked, and I'll also tell you whether or not uh, which class gets it. For example, some spells are Cleric only, Shaman only, Druid Shaman only, etc, etc. Let's go and get started. First spell on our list is Animal Summoning 1. This is available to Clerics, Druids, and Shamans, and it's a big piece of crap. This is a C tier spell all the way. Casting time is 7, lasts for 3 turns, the summons, and you call 2-3 to three animals that have 4 HD or less. This is awful. Every single time you cast this spell, you're going to get like 2 dogs, maybe a dire wolf these are incredibly weak it's incredibly incredibly weak which is amazing because you compare this to animate dead that clerics get a level three or really any other summoning spell in the game and this just falls short in such a big way it blows my mind clerics get animate dead druids and shamans get called woodland beings those are the two summon spells you want to be casting not animal summon i don't really i don't really know why this is a level four spell considering what you get from it Animals in general are already extremely weak in Baldur's Gate. They have mediocre stats, they sometimes tend to move quickly, wolves and dire uh, wolves especially do have a little bit of a speed boost, but that's really it. You really can't use these to tank because their HP is incredibly limited, their Thacko and damage is absolute dog shit. I mean, these will literally die in one auto attack, literally one auto attack. They're incredibly squishy, they do very little damage, they can't tank, they can't do anything. There's really no reason to ever cast this spell, especially when you have another one right next to it that's better in every way, shape, and form. I I really don't know what else to say about it. There's really nothing you can use to defend this. Uh, Wanda monster summoning exists in this game, but even when you compare it to just the, the, the wizard summoning spells, like they're both equally terrible. Summoning two hobgoblins and summoning two direwolves, I don't know which is worse. I guess the hobgoblins at least are ranged, right? And these actually have to melee, so I don't know. Maybe the wizard one actually unironically is better. I don't, I'm trying not to use that word because people keep bitching about me saying the word unironically and I can't fucking help it. Sorry about that, guys. But this spell blows. Big pass. There's really nothing remotely redeeming about this spell. I tried casting it multiple times, seeing if there was something decent I could get out of it. The tankiest and most highest damaging creature I got was a dire wolf. And dire wolves come in large packs and they die instantly. <laughs> so there's really nothing you could say to defend this spell let's just move on crappy spell skip it up next call woodland beings call woodland beings is available to druid and shaman only and unlike animal summoning this is an s tier spell this is absolutely amazing this will summon a nymph who has a variety of pre spells at their disposal they have mental domination they have confusion they have mass cure they have hold monster call lightning uh, miscast magic, bark skin, and one or two other crappy spells that really aren't worth mentioning. But the big ones here are Mass Cure, which you cannot get in Baldur's Gate 1 at all, right? You cannot get Mass Cure in Baldur's Gate 1 as a cleric. You cannot do it. A nymph actually has it that you can summon. You can summon multiple of these. Have them all cast Mass Cure to fully heal your party. They also have Hold Monster, which is still not amazing in Baldur's Gate 1, but it works for a variety of creatures that's nice. You have Confusion, which does come with a minus two penalty, which is an AoE Confusion spell. Obviously not as good as Chaos, but it's the one right below it. And then you have Call Lightning on top of it, which you just talked about last video. is such a ridiculously powerful spell. 
And then she also has Mental Domination and Miscast Magic, which, you know, aren't amazing, but they're not terrible either. It's something that she can use to actually, you know, really affect a fight. So you can summon a couple of these things. Excuse me. You can summon a couple of these things, and they can practically solo an encounter for you. They could literally solo an encounter for you, whether you're fighting humanoids, or whether you're fighting monsters, or whether you just need some extra healing for a fight. These things are amazing. If you have these before the Cloakwood fights, that will greatly... That could literally turn the tide. That can literally turn the tide of the Cloakwood ambush. It's absolutely amazing how good these are. Absolutely amazing. I, every single one of these spells are just awesome. Mass Cure is an S tier spell. We obviously haven't talked about it yet. Confusion's a strong spell. Not incredible, but for having it on a summon, that's really, really nice. Taking Confusion on a wizard, not all that good. Having it on a summon, that's pretty damn great. The fact they get so many spells just kind of makes these things kind of overloaded. It's like having an extra support offensive caster that can also cure on top of it. It's just amazing. Just an amazing all-around spell. Doesn't last for too long. Uh, cast time of seven, duration of three turns, but that lasts more than long enough. More than long enough for a fight. And the fact that you can have multiple of these all using their abilities, so if one charm misses, you get another. You have a couple woodland beings all throw a confusion spell out, chances are one of them's gonna hit. One of them's gonna hit. And then you get the mask here and the call lighting on top of that, and forget about it, man. I'm just repeating myself, because these are so good. They're so good. It's one of my favorite spells I take all the time as a druid. Um, for a shaman, also definitely pick this one up. This is a really good one. Don't want to miss this one. This obviously isn't going to do shit late and throw in a ball, but in Baldur's Gate 1, this is great. And even in Baldur's Gate 2, this is not a bad spell to take at all. But this is especially really, really strong in BG1. And the fights that you have it for, it's just, it's, it literally will turn the tide in and of itself. So good. Up next, Cloak of Fear. Cloak of Fear is dog shit. Has a cast time of six. Um, it says duration instant. Um, but I'm pretty sure this actually lasts for a couple turns. Um, I thought. I might be wrong. I might be wrong. But I thought this was supposed to last for a decent amount of time. But basically what this is, is this is a, literally a horror spell for a, uh, Oh, I forgot to mention that. Uh, Call Within Beings, Druid Shaman only, Cloak of Fear, Cleric Druid Shaman. Um, this is basically a horror spell at level 4. And we already talked about how hilarious it is that Warcry is a horror spell for an HLA. Having a horror at level 4 is just as embarrassing. Although not quite as embarrassing as having it as an HLA. That's literally what this is. This is a level 4 horror spell. It's dog shit. It has the exact same effect. Save her spell or run away. I think horror actually lasts longer than 4 rounds. So this is actually worse. In addition to it having a 15 foot radius. So you actually have to walk up to your enemies in order to make this hit in the first place. Which is just a terrible idea. You could argue that you could combine this with like, you know, you could take this on a paladin, for example, because they get level four spells. Or you could combine this with sanctuary and walk into a group of enemies and have them all feared. This is crap, dude. There's nothing you could say to defend this. It's just crap. Don't take it. C tier all the way. Big pass in my book. Up next is Cure Serious Wounds. Cure Serious Wounds actually has a longer cast time than the others. Cast time is seven. I believe the others have a cast time of five. Um, exact same. You have to touch somebody, so you have to be in melee. Although there actually is an interesting... I, I, I totally forgot to talk about this. If you... If you move your fighter or the person you're trying to heal and tell them to move next to the cleric and then immediately select a cleric and cast heal or cure serious wounds in this case and target that person, the game thinks that because they're moving to that destination, they're already there and you can actually heal them even when they're far away. I don't typically use that because it really 100% is a bug. But I did forget to mention that for the other videos. And I totally forgot about it and I apologize for that. So there's really, uh, it's really not impossible to get around the touch thing when it comes to touching your own, uh, when it comes to touching your own party members. Keep using the word touch now, it just sounds weird saying it. Touch and flesh are just two words that just sound weird to say. Um, so there is a way to get around that. But that being said, I still feel that just like the others, if I'm trying to heal somebody to full, I'm not going to use Cure Serious Wounds. I'm going to cast the actual spell Heal. I'm going to cast Heal. Or I'm just going to rest, in which case the Cure Light Wounds and the Cure Medium Wounds you take at level 1 and 2 are going to be sufficient to top off your party. And so I really don't end up taking this spell. Except for very, very rare circumstances when I just... I want to heal very, very quickly. Maybe I'm doing a timed quest or something. Or something of that nature to where I just want to rest once or twice and get healed to full rather than resting three or four times to heal everybody to full HP. This can heal for quite a bit. This can heal for up to 50 HP-ish 
which is a lot. Although you're going to have to be a higher level for that to actually happen. So we're getting to the point now where if you had two of these at level four and you're in Baldur's Gate 1, you could basically top off Kagan and have him get back in the fight. But even then, I still just don't end up taking this spell. For example, again, you, I know this is Cleric, uh, Druid, Shaman, and obviously Clerics can't get called Woodland Beings, but Druid and Shamans can. And I'd rather take this and drop a Mass Gear on my party than take a Cure Serious Wounds, because it's very rare that you're going to have only one character taking damage. And if it is Kagan, then all it takes is one rest to get back to full HP. I have this at B tier, just because there will be some times where you might end up getting use out of it, but for the most part, there's a lot of good spells at level 4, especially for Druid and Shaman. Especially for Druid and Shaman. Cleric, not so much, but the ones that clerics get are also absolutely mandatory that you never want to pass up on, so... I really have a hard time taking this spell, although it's not as bad as Cure Medium Wounds, the level 3 one. It's... For Cleric, it's not as bad, but for Druid and Shaman, it definitely is. So I guess it really depends on your class here. For Druid and Shaman, I would never take this. But for Cleric, you might end up taking it once or twice. So B tier for me. Up next, we got Death Ward. Death Ward is exceptional. Casting time of 9 targets one creature and it lasts from one turn per level. And this says it will make them immune to all forms of death magic, which includes, but is not limited to, Disintegrate, Power Word Kill, Death Spell, and Finger of Death. This will also work for Quivering Palm, which you'll need if you're doing Hexat's quest or fighting Balthazar or the monks in uh, Am Ketherin. Uh, so there are a couple other times where you really do want Death Ward up. Death spell, you really aren't going to ever have to worry about unless you're playing uh, the base game. In which case, enemies might try to hit you with a death spell when you are vulnerable to it, but that's really, that's really, really rare. For the most part, the reason you want this spell is because of um, finger, a finger of death and um, instant death effects like uh, decapitation effects, right? So uh, the uh, the stupid bitch. The planetar, for example, this will work with that. Uh, this technically will work with the Ravager, unfortunately. You know, Danny DeVito is still dead, so he didn't have that. Uh, this will work with a variety of insta-kill effects that is obviously not listed here. This will work for the insta-death effects from Baylor's, um, from... I believe this works for the uh, insta-death effects from other demons in addition to Baylor's. Um, really anything that will kill you instantly, aside from petrification, Death Ward will work on. This spell is absolutely mandatory once you get to Baldur's Gate 2 and going further just because there are so many enemies who are going to be using a variety of spells and abilities that will one-shot your main character. It gets to, it's to the point where Hindo's Doom is actually a good weapon just because it has passive death ward on it. This is really really important. I hate to give it an S tier rating but there will be a point in time where you do not want to continue without having death ward on your main character. Because these effects are so common. A planetar is always out. When you're in Watcher's Keep and fighting the demons, you have to have a Death Ward up. You cast it before going into the anti-magic area. Actually, I'm not even sure if you can do that now. Maybe I'm an idiot. I'm probably an idiot. Skip that. Pretend I didn't fucking say that shit. Let's move on. This spell is really, really useful. There are a variety of times you're going to need to have Death Ward up. It's absolutely mandatory. For a variety of encounters, especially in Baldur's Gate 2 and up, you technically get this in BG1, but you really don't need it for anything in BG1. This is mostly for BG2. You really don't have to worry about shit like Will the Banshee, because your saves are going to be so good that unless you're being, being hit with Malison, this doesn't... I, I don't really use this for, for Liches. This isn't really something you need for Liches. This is, well, aside from the Planetar, right? This is really what you need for Planetars and Demons. You have to have Death Ward up. Maybe this is A tier where it's just situationally. I think that's really a better place to put it. Putting it at A tier makes a lot more sense than putting it at S tier. Because situationally, this spell is absolutely mandatory. But you don't need to walk around with it 24-7 like you do with some other spells, right? You never leave home without a stone skin. You do occasionally leave home without death ward. So for that reason, it's A tier. But you absolutely have to have this when you're fighting high level wizards. 100% mandatory. You gotta protect yourself from planetars. You gotta protect yourself from balors. You just have to have this shit. You have to. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't uh, breathe spit, by the way. I don't know if your mother ever told you that, but it is very important not to breathe your own saliva. Mm. My lord. Excuse me. Up next is Defensive Harmony. This is a weird spell. This is available to Cleric only, I believe. Let me double check here. Oh no, it does say uh, Cleric, Druid, and Shaman, so everybody gets that. Uh, this is a weird spell. On paper, it looks great. Where it has a super quick cast time of 1, 15 foot radius, and everyone in your party gets a plus 2 bonus to armor class. The problem is this only lasts 6 rounds. If you compare this to Chant, or Prayer, or even Bless, this spell just feels really underwhelming for a level 4 spell. 
plus two AC isn't shit. I mean, it's nice when it stacks with all those things, which it does. But the fact that it only lasts for six rounds is really, really painful, to be honest. I guess you could argue that you can use this as a sequencer, right? You could sequencer chant, prayer, and defensive harmony into one sequencer as a cleric mage, for example, and just instantly drop all those uh, defensive spells right out the gate, giving you and your party a very nice boost for combat. And there are times when I do take this spell, but I think that's honestly only when I have a cleric. It's very rare that I take this on a druid. Although I have taken it on a druid in the past, specifically for encounters where I know that AC is going to make a difference, but for the most part, it really doesn't. In Baldur's Gate 1, you only have one, maybe four, a level 4 spell, unless you have ridiculously good wisdom. So at that point, you know, you're really going to be going for something that's really really more useful there's some really really good spells you get we already talked about it call woodland beings is awesome we'll talk about the other good spells later on here but you really don't have the opportunity to take something like this and when you get to baldur's gate 2 as a cleric you're really not going to be taking this much then anyways either because the plus two bonus to ac just isn't enough right at the right out the gate corgan is going to be the one who's in the front line more often than not hair doesn't need this shit because he's a wizard so depending on who's your front line Defensive Harmony is either superfluous if it's HD, and it does nothing whatsoever if you're Corgan. Because having that extra 2 AC doesn't matter, right? You don't get the Gauntlets of Dexterity until much later in the game, after you're doing the Beholder Dungeon. And so his base AC is already shit, right? His base AC is already dog shit. Getting an extra 2 bonus is useless, and for your backline, that's going to be your Wizards who already have Stone Skin and crap, right? So getting an extra 2 AC doesn't matter. Clerics um, might end up using it, but then they also have abilities to reflect uh, ranged weapons anyways, because they're not going to be getting hit by melee shit. The clerics are hiding in the back. So I just, I can't really think of a time where I'd be using this spell and saying, yes, that plus two AC is very useful and effective. I'm happy I take this. And yet, for some dumb reason, I take this spell all the time. I think it's just because chant and prayer are so intangible, but so strong that for some reason, I think the defensive harmony is the same, but it's not. What you get with this spell for the duration for a level four is just incredibly underwhelming. Incredibly underwhelming. And I take this spell all the time, but in honest, in all honesty, it's a C tier spell. In all honesty, it is a C tier spell. You would literally have to custom make a party in order to get decent use out of this spell. You'd have to have a ton of fighters all meleeing in order to actually make use out of this spell because the two AC is just, it's almost irrelevant. It's almost irrelevant. Maybe, I don't know, maybe for a paladin, right? For a paladin, there's really not a lot of things that you could really take because a lot of these scale with level, right? And paladin, well, for those that don't know, paladins and in, in, uh, shaman, or excuse me, paladins and rangers, when they start getting their cleric spells, they're not casting at paladin level. They're casting at cleric level of one, which is acquired at level eight and nine. So if you're a level nine paladin, you're casting, cure, uh, you're casting Cure Light Wounds as a level 1 Cleric. You're not casting it as a level 9 Paladin. You're casting as a level 1 Cleric. And that makes a difference. That makes a big difference when it comes to spells that are based on level. Which makes the all Ranger and, uh, and Paladin spellcasting really terrible, to be honest. Really, really crappy. And so for spells that are not based on level whatsoever, right? This doesn't have a duration based on your spellcasting level. Maybe this would be more useful on a paladin. Maybe this would be more useful on a paladin, right? He could just cast this real quick, get back into fighting. And obviously, you know, he's a paladin, so he is going to get some use out of the two AC. Chances are it's your main character, because obviously Keldorn's not going to get this. So chances are with the right build, you can actually take advantage of the plus two AC. But even then, I feel it's a stretch. I think this is just a C tier spell all the way. And there's really nothing you could do to stop it. I take the spell way too often for how bad it is. But like I said, in, in on paper, this spell looks fine. It has a low duration, but chant only lasts for one turn. And this is just a little bit more than half that duration. But what you get... And for how it affects the party, it just, it feels really underwhelming. Really underwhelming. This is just so irrelevant to most of the people in your party that all you're doing is basically giving one character plus two AC, and guess what? Protection from evil does that. So, it just, it kills me, but I think this spell is actually much, much worse than I originally thought, and so I'm going to drop it to C tier. 
Up next is Farsight. Farsight is borderline RP tier, although there is some ways you can make use out of it. Has a decent cast time of four, uh, it lasts for three rounds plus one per level, and it basically lets you see it, uh, an area on the map. The only reason this would possibly be useful is if A, you don't know what's coming, or B, you're trying to get line of sight of enemies so you can chuck spells from across the screen where they can't see you. On, but you, there's all sorts of ways to do that anyways, right? You can send summons ahead, uh, you can throw an invisibility on one of your party members and have them ahead to scout. There's all sorts of ways you can basically accomplish the same thing that Farsight does. You have Wizard Eye, for example. I like Wizard Eye a hell of a lot better than Farsight just because it's, it basically gives you vision, you can move it, and it's not a party member. So Wizard Eye isn't, even then, Wizard Eye is not really an S tier spell. It's useful in certain situations, but it's not S tier. And the fact that Farsight is a level four cleric spell um, I, again, I'm, I'm so sorry about mentioning this. This is Cleric, Druid, and Shaman. I forgot to say that again. This is Cleric, Druid, and Shaman. Druids and Shamans, you actually get some great shit at level 4. Cleric, not so much. I guess you could take this, but don't forget, this is localized, right? This is localized. A Wizard Eye or somebody who's invisible, you can move around, right? But you can't do that with Farsight. This is Borderline RP tier. I guess we could leave it C tier, because situationally, maybe you don't have a Wizard or you don't have an invisibility spell or something of that nature, you don't have an invisibility potion, and you need to see what's going on ahead because you don't know what's going on, so you can cast Farsight, but I don't think I've ever used this once in my life, aside from when I was like 12 playing this game for the first time. I was like, oh, what's this do? No, oh, it's interesting. But it's just, it kills me. It kills me. So I'm going to leave this C tier. We don't need to keep talking about it. It's pretty irrelevant. Up next is Giant Insect. This is a shame. This has a, a decent cast time of 7. They last for 8 hours, though, just like Anima Dead, right? So these things last forever. And what's what's frustrating, though, is Bombardier Beetles hit hard. They hit really hard. I remember them hitting hard as shit. They're obnoxious. But you can't use their Bombardier shit if you tell them to attack something. This is going to sound really weird. Let's say you summon a group of giant insects. And you tell them to attack somebody. They will not start launching their shit. They will walk up to the person and start auto-attacking. That makes these absolutely dog shit. In order for them to actually bombard, they have to not be told what to do, they have to see an enemy, and they have to bombard as a choice. And that sounds weird, but basically what I mean is, you have to summon this and not control them for them to have a chance of actually using their, uh, their ranged ability. You can't tell them to use it because it's not a clickable ability and it's not automatic. So when you tell them to attack somebody, they just walk up and melee. And that makes this way worse than it should be. I would still leave this at B tier because you can obviously get around that by just not giving them orders. And they last eight hours and they hit quite hard. But this spell could have been S tier if you could actually control them. But you can't. And for that reason, this is B tier all the way. It has a very long duration, a decent cast time, and they hit hard as hell, but you can't control them. It's kind of like summoning a demon, right? With the exception that this obviously doesn't attack your party, it only attacks enemies. But still, it's this, this could have been so good, but you just the fact that you can't tell them who to attack it just makes it so much worse than it should be. Uh, this is Druid and Shaman only, so Clerics obviously can't get it. Um, it could have been so good, but yeah. We're going to leave it at B tier just because they do hit hard and you can make use out of it. But you have to keep that in mind. You cannot tell them who to, you cannot tell them who to attack. They just have to be set on auto attack and let the AI control them. Up next is negative plane protection. This is garbage. Uh, last, uh, targets one creature, last uh, five rounds, decent cast time of three. I believe this is uh, Cleric, Druid, and Shaman is indeed. And this is C tier because it only lasts five rounds. This is a super, this negative plane protection is absolutely mandatory when you're fighting vampires with SES installed. They hit way too damn often. They have all sorts of nasty abilities to keep them from dying quickly and easily. You absolutely have to have this shit. You have to have this when you're fighting uh, the Shade Lord. Well, you don't have to because the Shade Lord can die pretty easily. If you don't know what you're doing against the Shade Lord, this becomes more useful. Uh, this becomes useful against the Shadow Dragon. Really, anybody that does level draining. But this is by far most useful against vampires because they do it over and over. Well, the Shade Lord and the Shadow Dragon, you really don't need this as much, although it is nice to have. But again, there are better ways to get around that. If you have the Mace Disruption plus two, you have passive negative plane protection. If you have Yagashura's Warhammer, you have passive negative plane protection. If you have Berserking, you have passive negative plane protection. Every single one of those lasts a hell of a lot longer than five rounds. A hell of a lot longer than five rounds. It is very, very rare that you will have a fight with a vampire lasting less than five rounds. The only time this would ever happen and be useful is when you're fighting the one fledgling vampire just south 
of the uh, the drow with the spiders in the crypt uh, graveyard of Athkatla. Every other fight against vampires are going to be fighting Ancient or uh, some other stupidly powerful vampire in a massive group to where negative plane protection is going to be absolutely useless. This is going to wear off long before that fight is over and people are going to get drained and murdered very, very quickly. If you wanted to cast this on your whole party, you can't with one cleric. It will literally wear off on the first person you cast it on before you get to cast it on the last person in your party. This duration is just absolutely horrible. You could argue that maybe in a super long fight, Corgan's uh, Berserker Rage is down and he can't use it again. So you give him a quick negative plane protection so he can stay in the fight. But I guess oh, I totally forgot Amulet of Power is the same thing, right? Amulet of Power. So typically what ends up happening, though, in my games is you have one or two people in the front line. Typically myself and Corgan. If you're a fighter, you're using Mesa Disruption plus two. If you're a caster, you're using Amulet of Power, and Corrigan's got Berserking. And that's how you deal with vampires. That's how you deal with vampires. You have them focus, the two people fighting. If you want to use Hair to Lease, you give them Amulet of Power too, right? If you're, for some reason, you don't want to tank with your main character, you use Hair to Lease and Corrigan, Amulet of Power, Mace of Disruption, Berserking. That's how you get around this shit. You do not use this spell. This spell is terrible. There's not a single time in the history of the game where I've cast this and said, yeah, that's exactly what I needed to do this fight. Perfect. Thank you, negative plane protection. You're going to be using an item or ability that gives you this buff, not the spell itself. C tier all the way. I wouldn't say it's RP tier because there might be a time when you need this, but it's damn close. It's really bad. Up next is Neutralized Poison. This one is really tough for me. This is a cast time of one. Uh, hits one person. It will neutralize poison, restore 10 HP, and cure disease at the same time. So this is like a combination of slow poison, cure disease, and cure light wounds. That on paper sounds really good, but you really don't need that, to be honest. The only time I could really see this being useful is if you know you're fighting a bunch of greater mummies, right? The neutralized poison will kind of do the all-in-one heal, which makes it actually pretty good, which makes it pretty good. But it's only for that particular situation. For the rest of the time, I'd rather just use slow poison or cure disease, you know what I mean? But for that situation, this spell is pretty damn good. I originally had this at B tier, but I think just because Greater Mummies are so damn scary, Neutralized Poison is probably an A-tier spell. Just for those particular situations. Greater Mummies can literally kill Corgan in a round. The damage you take is absurd. If you get it, I literally do not melee on my main character. I do not go anywhere near Greater Mummies because I am so afraid of getting breathed on. Mummy Breath is absolutely deadly as hell. And Neutralized Poison is a great way of dealing with it. But it's still too risky for me, so I'm never going to do that, but... If you know you're fighting greater mummies, take a neutralized poison. It's great. Aside from that one situation, there is no reason to ever take this spell. No reason to ever take this spell. If you aren't fighting greater mummies, there's no reason for this. So I'm going to leave it at A tier just for that specific situation. Because greater mummies aren't really that uncommon, right? They're not that uncommon. If you're in an area with undead, chances are you're running into greater mummies if you're playing on the same difficulty I am. So for that reason, A tier, but... Outside of that, never take it. Up next is Poison. Poison's another spell that's really weird. I'm so sorry. Cleric Druid Shaman again. Poison. Also Cleric Druid Shaman. I'm going to say that right out the gate this time. This spell looks like it'd be really good on paper, but every single time I cast this spell, the enemy always successfully saves. Always, every single time, and it kills me. Because on paper, that looks like it would do a lot of damage. It has good scaling, right? Targets one creature. Decent cast time of four. Lasts for a full turn. And you can see the damage right here. Early on, 2d8 plus 2 per round, not bad. 17 plus, 8d8 plus 6 per round, not bad for a level 4 spell, right? But those who make their save are completely unaffected. And that's what makes this so painful. So the only other spells I can think of that are do absolutely nothing if they fail their save would be Chaos, Sleep, Hold Person, stuff like that. Fireball will always do damage if they fail their save. Always. If they um, pass their save, I mean. The spells that don't, you'll notice, are all crowd control spells. But most importantly, they're AoE spells, right? So chances are, that's going to hit somebody, right? It's going to hit somebody. I have never once cast a sleep and not had it hit at least half my opponents. Never once. With the exception of the Sirens, because they got that massive plus four boost with uh, improved invis. But whole person, sleep, chaos... Chances are it hits somebody. Chances are it hits somebody. So even though if they uh, pass their save, it would do nothing, it's going to hit one of them there. 
Poison, however, only targets one person. Just one. And if they if they pass their save, make their save, I should say. If they make their save, they take absolutely nothing whatsoever, and this spell did nothing. And that is really painful for a level 4 spell, to be honest. That's really painful. You'll see that with a couple Icewind Dale spells, where it does absolutely nothing. But those spells are also going to be AoE for the most part, not single target. And that kills me for this reason. And for that reason, I'm leaving it at C tier. I haven't hit by the spell more than once, and it does a ton of damage on insane difficulty. Molahe especially loves to cast this shit, and it hits hard. But every single time I try, it fails. And for that reason, C tier. Up next is Produce Fire. This is an interesting one. Uh, decent cast time is 7, 4 foot radius, uh, 1 round. It will target 1 creature. And it will deal 1d4 points of fire damage plus 1 per level of the caster to all creatures within the spell's radius. This is obvious where it's used. Fighting trolls. That is it. That is the only time you'd ever want to use produce fire. Is with the new SES, fire will break the regeneration and allow you to kill them. But for that, it's actually pretty damn useful. That's not bad. I don't want to cast a fireball in the front line because I don't want to hit my party with it. This, however, doesn't do nearly as much damage as a fireball. Not nearly as much damage. So you're going to expect to take maybe 20 to 30 damage from this ship, as opposed to a fireball, which could do, you know, up to 100 damage if your frontline fails their save. So this is actually pretty good in that regard. Not amazing, but situationally, this is not bad. I'm not going to put it in an 8-tier spell, because I still, I still personally don't really think it's all that necessary. Death spell will one-shot most trolls, and if you're fighting spirit trolls, I mean, you can't target them with this shit. But this will also work on your own party, right? So you can send Corgan into the front line, cast produce fire on him, and it's going to hit all the trolls around them and break the regeneration for a little bit. That's pretty damn useful. Only in that one rare situation at Diarnus Keep. But for that, it's not bad at all. So for that, B tier. Not amazing, but situationally not bad. Up next, protection from lightning. Decent cast time of 7, targets one creature. And unlike the other crappy uh, resistance spells that clerics, druids, and shamans get... Oh my god, I did it again, didn't I? I did it again. Kill me, dude. Produce fire is druid and shaman only. My apologies, guys. I'm so sorry about that. I am apologize. I keep forgetting to say that. Druid and shaman only. And protection from lightning over here is druid and shaman only. I think I gotta double check that. I thought clerics got this too. I thought clerics got uh, this too. I'm gonna have to double check that in a minute. For now, druid and shaman only. And unlike the other resistance spells that they get, this actually lasts a decent amount of time. Lightning is really uncommon. I wouldn't say it's super uncommon. Uh, Narcillus will use lightning. Uh... The chick in the cloakwood mines will use lightning. Devarin will occasionally use lightning. There's a couple traps that use lightning bolt. So, and of course, every druid's going to be casting call lightning. So if you're fighting druids, protection from lightning is really, really nice. And those situations lasting five rounds per level is decent enough to where you can cast this before a fight starts on multiple people, and it will not wear off until long after the fight is over. And that makes this situationally decent. So for that, it's B tier. Not amazing. It's not often you're going to be fighting lightning. But this lasts long enough to where, unlike the other spells, which are like Resist Fire and Cold, for example, is like one round per level, that shit's worthless. But you can cast this on anybody in your party, they're completely immune, and it lasts long enough for it to actually matter. For that reason, B tier. Up next is Smashing Wave. Smashing Wave is Druid and Shaman. I'm looking at my fucking little piece of paper right now. And this spell is actually really strong. This is an S tier spell. Uh, this might be a weak S tier spell, but it's still S tier. Very long cast time of 9. It shoots a five foot wide wave that moves in the direction willed by the caster, striking all on its path with massive force, party included. But it travels up to 100 feet, does 40, 10 points of crushing damage. In addition, struck creatures may either be stunned, 25% chance, or knocked unconscious, 5% chance for two rounds. The creature has struck has to make a successful save versus breath weapon. And the damage is reduced by half, and the creature avoids being stunned or knocked up if they successfully save. The reason this is so good is because of this shit right here. Save first breath. Save first breath is the worst saving throw in the entire game. For everybody except a fighter. A level 40 thief has a save first breath that's double digits. 11. That is insane. I think fighters are the only ones who actually get a decent save first breath. And max uh, saving throw, it's like 4, maybe 5. But almost every other class in the game has a very, very weak save first breath. It is very, very weak. Usually one of the worst, if not the worst saves they have. Most spells are save first spell. And save first spell is typically not amazing, but pretty good for most classes. 
And then there's also all sorts of spells like Spirit Armor, for example, that boost the, that particular save. Save vs. Breath is the hardest thing to save in this game. There isn't shit that enemies will have that will give them a boost to save vs. Breath. And that means this will happen all the time. All the time enemies will fail their save. And it does crushing damage, which typically is going to be not mitigated whatsoever, right? There isn't... Um, uh, skeletons, for example, are going to have uh, no crushing resistance whatsoever. Um, typically, as far as damage reduction goes, crushing is last on the list. Crushing is last on the list. Fire is going to be very commonly resisted. Magic is going to be very commonly resisted. Um, slashing, piercing, very commonly resisted. Crushing is not. Crushing, as we all know, is arguably the best damage source in the game when it comes to physical combat. And this doing crushing damage is also pretty damn nice. The fact that it also has a chance to stun or knock them unconscious on top of it is great. And most importantly, if you are hitting your front line with this, which is very bad because this can do up to 80 damage if they, um, if, they, uh, if they fail their save. But the thing is, that's unlikely to happen. Because the only people in your party who should be getting hit by this are your front line. And your front line should be somebody who's going to be immune to this shit right or they're gonna be corgan or somebody else like that a fighter who with berserking up is gonna have pretty decent saves actually i'm not i don't remember if Berser i always forget if it's the barbarian rage or berserking that gives plus two to save or spell only i'm not sure if berserking gives plus two to all saves or just save or spell i have to double check but regardless a pure fighter very likely to pass the breath weapon effect also if you have the uh, belt of inertial barrier you can pass that to your front line making it almost guaranteed for them to save so the damage they would take would be very little if at all and of course you could always move them out of the way too this is fairly easy to dodge this is not like a fireball where the radius is massive where you have to move your front line out of the way long before the spell goes off otherwise they're gonna get hit this is a five foot wave Fairly easy to dodge, and chances are your front line's hasted, so dodging this is child's play. And it hits pretty damn hard, and it hit has a nasty effect on top of it, and people almost always fail their save here. Save versus breath is just great. This is arguably the best thing to have on a spell, because enemies are going to fail that all the damn time. And for that reason, this, like I said, it may seem like I'm overrating it, but this is, this is one of the most reliable spells I've gotten from Icewind Dale. As far as non-passive buffing spells go from Icewind Dale, this is one of the best you get. This is literally one of the best things they added. Very, very reliable. So for that, S tier. Up next is Star, Magil, uh, Star Metal Cudgel. Decent cast time of 7, lasts for 3 turns, and unlike the others... Well, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. This makes uh, a meteoric, not iron magical club that deals 1d6 plus 2 points of crushing damage, plus 2 bonus to attack rolls, and it's treated as a plus 4 weapon for what it can hit. Unlike the others, though... Strength, proficiency, and specialization bonuses and penalties apply normally. And that's what makes this actually worse. Because you have to put points in clubs to really get use out of this. The only person who's going to be using a club would be either a shaman or a druid, right? And even then, if you're a druid, you want to use scimitars. You want to throw a bellman in your offhand, and then eventually you're going to get to the point where you're using an earth elemental transformation, but you're really not meleeing as a druid. Even as a fighter druid, you really aren't meleeing. And as a shaman, shamans have even more uh, penalties than druids do. I really don't see me meleeing as a shaman either. You're really used as an offensive support caster. Insect plague, you know, call lightning, static charge, shit like that. And maybe some backup heals if that's what your party needs at the time. I really don't find this fitting the play style at all here. I gotta look at my piece of paper again. Yeah, this is indeed druid shaman only. Druid shaman only. I'm not sure if I said that about smashing wave. I'm absolutely doing terrible about that. I apologize. I'm going to look at my piece of paper before I talk about the next spell from now on. I promise we'll get it right. But it makes this incredibly underwhelming. Because you have to have points in clubs to actually get use out of this. And putting a point in club is just... That's just awful. Clubs are arguably the worst weapon in the game. Not because... Um, it's partly because the club damage base is just dog shit to begin with. But then on top of it, they're, the weapon they get and throw in a ball is the club of detonation, I believe. And compared to something like Fobane even flail of the ages from fair you know every other weapon in the game comes with either a really powerful boost or it's just an all-around solid weapon and the club gets screwed in that regard the club gets screwed pretty hard scimitars aren't great either even longsword is kind of iffy but when it comes to the big five right axes flails hammer um bastard sword 
and two-handed sword. You really, you get some great shit there. You get some really good shit. The other weapons are kind of lackluster, but club is probably one of the worst. Club is probably one of the worst one-handed weapons you can choose. Because there are just a, a complete lack of magical clubs in the game. And the final one you get in TOB that's supposed to be like your ultimate weapon. Just turns out to be shit on top of it. And so for that reason, I really can't possibly rate this anything other than C tier. It's, it's, it sucks to say that. Because this actually, unlike the others, gives a decent bonus here. Of plus two... Plus two, 1d6 plus two. So it really is a magical club plus two. but And it also does 2d6 points of additional crushing damage against unnatural creatures. But again, it's just not enough. It's not enough. And I still wouldn't want to melee. Like I said, I, I do not want to be meleeing on my druid. I just don't. And if you're a fighter druid, chances are you're going to be using, again, a scimitar. I guess there might be a time. There might be a time as a fighter druid, although you really have limited proficiency points, right? As a fighter druid, because the way the level table works. So, if you're dual wielding and a fighter druid, you can put two points in scimitar, two points in dual wielding. Actually, I don't know. Yeah, two, two. And then you can put a point into clubs and then maybe a second point. But even then, that just seems, that just seems crazy to me. It just seems really crazy. I guess you could kind of get some use out of this in uh, late Baldur's Gate 1 when you're a high enough level to where you can actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with most undead. But you can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with skeleton warriors. You can't. You're going to lose that fight every time. And do you really need this when you're fighting regular skeletons or a ghast or something like that? And even then, I don't want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a ghast either. There's just no point in time where I'd be like, where I A, want to melee with my druid, and B, am fighting undead, and C, don't have a better weapon to use, and D, don't have a spell that I'd want to be using instead. So you have all four of those things. That's where you'd find a use for Star Metal Cudgel. And that's just so damn rare. I think this this and the Moonblade are probably the best summon weapons you can get. Outside of Black Blade of Disaster, obviously. But they're just not enough. They're not enough to take away from another spell you could be casting. And you still just never want to get into melee as a druid. You just don't. You just don't have the HP for that shit. I don't even want to get into melee as a fighter in Baldur's Gate 1. Let alone a druid, man. It's just not good enough. It's just not good enough for me. C tier all the way. You, there are probably going to be people, especially if you're not playing on insane difficulty, I'm sure you could get decent use out of this. But if you are, you don't want to send your druid into melee. You just don't. Up next is Static Charge. Static Charge is amazing. Long cast time of 9, 1 turn per level, visual range of caster. This is literally Call Lightning, except it could be used indoors. We already talked about how incredibly ridiculous Call Lightning is. This is the exact same spell, but usable indoors. S tier all the way. We really don't need to talk about it again. This spell hits absolutely ridiculously hard. Ridiculously hard. It is amazing. S tier all the way. Take it, use it. One of my favorite spells, especially if you're a pure druid or shaman, this shit is going to hit like an absolute truck. We don't need to keep talking about it because I talked about Call Lightning so much last video, but this is amazing. This is literally... This and Call Lightning are going to be the two spells you use all the time as a druid if you're not summoning insects. Super good. Take it. Alright, Thorn Spray. Thorn Spray... Oh, um, sorry. Holy shit, I did it again anyways. Claire... Excuse me. Druid, shaman only. Thorn Spray, also druid, shaman only. Wall of Moonlight, also druid, shaman only. Got that knocked out of the way. So nobody can fucking talk to me about that and say, Hey, Dav, you forgot to say whether it's cleric, druid, or shaman. Because I know you're already thinking it, and you're absolutely right, because I've been fucking up all video, and I apologize for that. Druid, shaman only for the rest of these spells here. Thorn Spray is also actually pretty damn decent. Thorn Spray is also actually pretty damn good. And like I said, for some weird reason, a lot of the spells you got from Icewind Dale for Druid and Shaman are actually pretty crappy. But for level 4, a lot of them are really amazing, to be honest. This isn't super great. This is a B-tier spell, but it's pretty good. Very quick cast time of 3, range of 30 feet, and this is literally a Cone of Cold, except it's doing 40, 10 points of piercing damage to all creatures in the area of effect. It's not bad, right? That's not bad at all. Exact same damage as Smashing Wave, also physical. So obviously this isn't going to do as much to certain types of enemies. But at the same time, this is a level 4 spell, right? So this is going to go through Minor Globe, just like Smashing Wave will. So this actually, you can get some decent use out of this fighting wizards in Baldur's Gate 1. And that alone makes this fairly good. There's also a variety of times where you're just encountering a mass of enemies that are in that group, right? And normally, druids don't have, uh, druids and shamans don't have good AoE. 
They just don't. But Smashing Wave and Thorn Spray are actually pretty great for that. And if they're spread out in an area, like the way Giverlings always are, and you don't have a Skull Trap or uh, a Wizard up to, up to plate, hit him with one Thorn Spray, and that's going to wipe the whole damn map clean. And again, the cast time of three actually makes it really, really quick to cast, too. So... I mean, there's, it's really nice. There's not like really anything amazing to say about the spell. Like, well, if you do this, this is a super cool trick you can have with Thorn Spray. This is just literally a cone effect, 40, 10 points of piercing damage, super quick cast time of three. That's a decent spell. Decent spell. B tier all the way. Not amazing. I wouldn't take a lot of these, but I usually end up taking one or two. One or two. Compared to the Static Charge, I mean, Static Charge is amazing. Smashing Wave also is a bit better because it actually has a chance to do these things too. But also, don't forget... There's no saving spell for, thro for uh, thro Thorn Spray, right? There's no save here. And that is pretty damn rare. For the most part, spells in this game, if they don't come with a save, that spell is good. That spell is automatically better than most just because of that. Because it makes it incredibly reliable. And reliability is so key when you're playing no save, no reload, dude. And this is a reliable damage spell. One of the most reliable damage spells in the game. But again, since it's AoE and comes in a cone, you do have to position your party. So just keep that in mind. But not bad. B tier. B tier. Up next is, uh, well, Moonlight. Druid and Shaman only, as I mentioned before. And this one, I, I wanted to like this spell more than I did. And uh, I ended up not liking it. Decent cast time of 7. Lasts one turn. And this will create an intangible wall requiring no physical anchor that can be passed through. Evil creatures pass through the wall, take 2d10 points of magic damage. Evil undead creatures creatures take 5d10. Any creature that is passed through the wall can only take damage from once. The reason this spell, again, no save throw, right? So it should be good, is not as good, is because it doesn't go through MR. Greater mummies, skeleton warriors, not regular skeletons, skeleton warriors all have MR. And so it's very likely that these things will walk through the wall and take no damage whatsoever. Because they just resist with magic resistance. This will also hit evil party members. So if Vicky walks through this, chances are she's going to be fine. She's got magic resist. But Corgan's going to take damage every time. Edwin's going to take damage every time. And if you're evil, you're also going to take damage every time. Because there's no save, right? There's no blocking it unless you have MR. There's no blocking it unless you have MR. But the thing is, there's so many times in the game where you're fighting undead in a corridor. And so it would be really useful... For those situations. I have tried using this in the Athkatla Crypts. I have tried using this in the Shade Lord Dungeon. I have tried using this in the Amketherin Dungeon. There's plenty of times where you're going to be fighting undead in a tight corridor. And forcing them to pass through the Wall of Moonlight means they're going to be taking 5d10 damage every time they walk through it. Although they can only take damage from it once. I mean as in every time they're walking through that corridor, they're going to end up taking 5d10 right out the gate. But that's that's just not good enough for me. That's just not good enough. Smashing Wave does 4d10, so 1d10 less. And granted, they can save against it, right? But it's just... It's a save versus breath, and save versus breath is so uncommon. And it just, it kills me. It just kills me. I don't know. Maybe I am under, maybe I am underestimating this spell. The damage it did against the Spectral Undead was actually quite nice, I have to say. Spectral Undead took a lot of damage from the Wall of Moonlight. Killed a lot of them very, very quickly. But Spectral Undead aren't hard to kill anyways. They're just not. They have very low HP. A fighter can take them down quickly. If you're a decent level with a good cleric, you can one-shot them all immediately. I mean, it's just... This spell ends up coming, coming across as underwhelming. Although on paper, it looks like it'd be really useful. I think if you're playing with a full good party, this spell is a great spell. I would put this in A tier just for those specific situations. But as I mentioned, a lot of the times, the higher level undead are going to have so much MR that the Wall of Moonlight's just not going to do anything at all. And granted, you know, MR can also prevent Smashing Wave, right? It's entirely possible that you can resist Smashing Wave because I don't think this goes through MR either. But at the same time, I don't know. It's it's tough. It's really tough because Smashing Wave hits everything, not just evil creatures. And for that reason, Smashing Wave is just as good in those tight corridors as Wall of Moonlight. For me, very underwhelming. I'm going to probably upgrade this to B tier. I had it C tier originally just because I always play evil. But let's be honest, nobody plays evil but me. Everyone plays good. And if you have a full party of good, there's no reason not to take this and cast this in those tight quarters because it is going to be useful. But again, compared to some of the other shit you get here, I just don't see myself ever taking Wall of Moonlight. I just don't. It just never happens. All right, we're going to go outside and rest real quick just so I can get the, uh, the cleric spell up here. 
or the excuse me the shaman spell to show up on my list uh let's see go and bring this up here and here it is spirit fire spirit fire is a decent cast time of four 15 foot radius and as the shaman casts the spell he's gonna throw a sphere that explodes into a bunch of pretty colors does 1d4 points of magic damage per level to shaman up to a max of 10d4 and there's a 33 percent chance that every enemy in the area of the effect will be afflicted by the doom spell which gives them a minus two penalty to saving throws and attack rolls for one turn a successful save will half the damage and negate the doom effect as always spirits fake creatures elementals and spectral undead take double damage 10d4 is lackluster as hell 10d6 is lackluster as hell 10d4 is even worse this doesn't need to actually target an enemy. Done. So unlike some other spells that require it to be cast on a central point, like for example, force missiles, this doesn't. I can cast it literally anywhere. I can cast it right here, right here, right here. The AoE radius is actually quite significant. It's actually a little bit larger than a fireball, at least it appears to be. Um, even though it says 15 foot radius, so do keep that in mind that the radius is actually quite big. If I cast it right here, it's going to hit both these sirens and still spread out even further. The way the doom, the way this reads is actually not how it works. There's an, a separate roll for every single person. It's not that there's a 33% chance for everyone to get hit by the doom and then they each have to save. It's a 33% chance per person and then they have to save. So take that as you will. I guess you could argue that it's useful it could be more useful in either way, um, but that's the way it works, is that each person, 33% chance, and then they save if that 33% mark is hit. It's not like 33% where it's going to hit everybody and then everybody has to save. There will be plenty of times you cast this where only one person has to save. The others didn't get hit by it at all. So that's the way that works in that regard. Double effect on spirits, fake creatures, elementals, and spectral undead. Absolutely irrelevant. As we already talked about before, Spectral Undead are one of the easiest undead to fight in this game. No reason to be casting this shit, although I guess you could. Maybe you don't have a cleric, maybe you don't have a fighter. Maybe you're playing solo for whatever reason, you want to play a solo shaman, and you just want to cast this to wipe out a bunch of Spectral Undead. You can, you can do that. That makes this a bit better, but that is so incredibly situational. And again, the damage is just so lackluster that with all the other spells you get here, it's just, it's painful to me. 10d4, right? 10d4. You could argue that's the same damage that a Crushing Wave does, but Crushing Wave will also stun or knock people unconscious, and they have a much less chance of saving because it's save versus breath. And Crushing Wave is also fairly easy to control. Well, with this Spirit Fire spell, you're going to have to maneuver your front line a lot more. Dodging a 5-foot radius wave? So much easier than actually dodging a, um, a massive AoE spell. So for that reason, I have it at C tier. You can make some use out of it, but mostly it's just... It's irrelevant. It's painfully irrelevant. So now we're going to talk about cleric spells. These are cleric only, so we don't have to worry about me saying it's cleric, druid, or shaman. First spell up is Blood Rage. This is an Icewind Dale spell. Cast time of 7, lasts 2 turns, and this will target a creature who will become immune to charm, sleep, fear, hold, stun, confusion, emotion, symbol, and related effects. They also get 2 to hit, 3 to damage, 2 strength, 10 max HP, plus 2 movement rate. However, this is the same as Minx Berserking. You lose complete control of this character, and it will move on and attack target after target until there's nothing left to hit. So you lose complete control of the character. At the end of the spell duration, the target becomes fatigued, and his strength drops to 3 for 2 turns. It cannot affect and cannot be cast by creatures of lawful alignment, and this only works on the player character, as in your character, and summoned creatures. That is so incredibly specific on what this will target that it makes this spell practically useless. And it's incredibly painful because this spell on paper is awesome. If you could target Kagan or Corgan with this shit and have them go into combat, that would be awesome. Well, Corgan basically gets berserking anyways, right? But it's pl plus two to strength is not to be underwritten at all. And two to movement is also fairly nice. Two hit, three damage, two strength. That's super good. Super good. You're going to get a massive boost to power on one character. But again, you can't target characters with this. And of course, at the end of the spell's duration... <laughs> this is awful. I don't want this ever happening to anybody. Granted, it lasts two turns and chances are combat would be over, but you just, you don't have time to do this because you don't want to do this on the main character, right? I don't care what class you are. You never want to cast this on your main character. Losing control of your main character on insane difficulty with SCS is just a very, very bad idea. You are almost certainly going to end up dying unless you're fighting creatures that you don't need the spell for in the first place. And then the second effect is you can use it on charm on summon creatures, right? But they have to be the right alignment. And the summon creature... What summon are you going to use this with, right? 
Because then the summon can start attacking you. Don't forget. The summon can start attacking you, which you don't want to do. <laughs> and I just... I, I don't understand how to really get good use out of this spell. I think... I think the best way to get use out of this spell would be to use summon invisible to get line of sight of the creature, move it into range of your enemies, cast this spell, and then run away and wait for that creature to do its work or die. But chances are, even with the, if it has all this effects up, if that creature is getting focused because your party's not there, that creature is going to die immediately anyways. It doesn't matter what it is. Unless it's a planetar. In which case, you still aren't going to use this shit because the planetar has got 100 MR. And this is... does I don't think this goes through MR. When I tested this, I'm pretty sure it got blocked uh, when I tested putting 100 MR on my main character. And now I'm not sure because I tested this a long time ago. But even then, <laughs> you don't want to have that planetar going confused. Because that's literally what happens is it goes berserk and it'll start attacking everything around you. And even then, what it gets is irrelevant. The planetar doesn't need this shit because the planetar already has all this shit. A planetar is basically immune to everything because it's got 100 MR. It already moves at a bonus movement rate. It doesn't need a plus 2 bonus to strength and uh, tackle and damage, although it's not bad to have. The 10 HP is completely worthless. I mean, I just, I don't see what you would be using this on and when. You'd have to somehow maneuver this target into melee away from your party. But like I said, it's just going to die in seconds. It's just going to die stupidly quickly. And casting this on the main character, it doesn't matter what your class is. That's just suicide. That's just stupid as hell. So there's really no good way to get use out of Blood Rage. I have it at C tier. If you have an idea of how to make use of this spell, let me know. But in my experience, this is just absolute crap. Absolute crap. Up next is Cause Serious Wounds. Uh, this is a... I believe I have this as a B tier just because... Uh, clerics, unlike druids, don't actually get damage spells. They don't get shit. They have poison, they have uh, Cloud of Pestilence, and that's it. That's literally it. And Cloud of Pestilence is like 3 damage per round or something pathetic. So you don't actually have a damage spell at level 4 as a cleric. And for that reason, this is not terrible. Not great, though. 48 plus 1 uh, per level. Uh, save for spell for half. Target's a creature, obviously not undead. Decent cast on a 5, and you have to touch. So, that's basically it. 48 plus 1 per level. Not amazing. Not terrible. Targets one creature. But again, it's your only damage spell. L the only damage spell you get is a cleric. So, I'm going to leave it at B tier. Just because if you need some damage, you can take it. But for the most part, you're not going to use it. Up next is Cloud of Pestilence, which can only be cast by evil creatures. I actually like this spell. This spell I actually like. I have this at A tier. It has a decent cast on a 7. Lasts 4 rounds. 12 foot uh, radius. Saving through negates. But the creature must save for its breath or suffer 3 points of damage, 3 points of strength and dex, and then blind for 1 round. The reason I end up take, uh, liking this more is because you can consider it a glitter dust that also has a curse built into it on top of it. And that's actually not bad. That's not bad. It's not amazing, but it's not terrible. Blinding creatures is always super useful. Chances are... Um, you're not going to be failing this spell on your front line because your front line is going to be, again, mostly fighters, right? You're not going to be sending a thief into melee that's stupid. The back line, clerics and uh, druids and mages aren't going to be going to the front line that's stupid. You might have Herodelis go on the front line, but you can just throw up a quick spell immunity and he's fine. Save for his breath, we already talked about before, is really hard to save against. Most enemies are going to fail save for his breath because it's just, without a doubt, the shittiest save in the game, with the exception of... Uh, of fighters so this ends up hitting way more often than not blind is for a turn the three points of strength and dexterity that's whatever the three points of damage that's whatever but that combined with the blindness combined with saver's breath combined with it lasting four rounds and not just like one or two like some other crappy cloud spells that actually makes this pretty decent it's evil only so unless you're Viconia, you're not casting this or a custom character obviously because most clerics are not evil vicky's the only one but like I said, you still actually can make some decent use out of this. You can make some decent use out of this. Saver's Breath, Blind, 3 points of damage, 3 strength and dex, AoE, lasts for a turn. It's not bad at all. Not bad at all. Uh, a tier might be overrating it, but I have found this to be fun and useful. And unlike the other spells, this one doesn't really hit my party uh, that often. It really doesn't. It hits enemies way more, and it's fairly useful in that regard. So, we already talked about all these. Up next is Free Action. Free Action is B tier. Uh, free action, I have a love-hate relationship with. Free action will, uh, from uh, Edventar's gift, you can manipulate that to actually give yourself haste. The free action spell will cancel haste and make you immune to haste. So you really can't manipulate it as well. 
It lasts for one turn plus one round per level, and will make them immune to web, hold person, grease, and tangle, uh, movement speed boosts, and movement speed penalties. There are going to be times you're going to want free action, but I typically find me using Edventar's Gift, the Ring of Free Action, that you get more often than this spell. There are going to be times where you want this spell on more than your front line, so you can take it and use it. I think I've taken and used this maybe once or twice, and that's it. In Baldur's Gate 2, where you're really going to get more use out of the level 4 spells, you don't ever want free action up, because you want improved taste. Your front line needs improved taste, that's how they're doing their damage. Corgan, Mazzy, whatever fighter you have, whatever uh, ranger, paladin, of using Minsk or Keldorn, you want them to have improved taste. Free action stops them from having improved taste, which means their damage is going in the toilet. And again, you also encounter less abilities that restrict action in Baldur's Gate 2. So you really don't get much use out of this. In BG1, you have Spider's Bane, you have two Edventar's Gifts, one off Dushai and Wolkath's Beard, and one off uh, uh, Cloudwolf's Party at the top of the Iron Throne. So you have all sorts of ways to deal with free action in BG1, where Web, Hold, Grease, and Tangle are common. And in Baldur's Gate 2, you don't have those nearly as often, although you don't have Edventar's Gift until Spellhold, but you just don't encounter it enough. You don't encounter it enough. And casting free action again when you have improved taste is just painful. So for that reason, I leave this at B tier. I think I have a B tier. Yeah, I have a B tier. And it's just, it sucks because this spell could be very useful, but the time you get it, you just don't encounter this shit enough to begin with. And combining that with the fact that you can't get around losing the attacks from improved taste just makes it super painful. And you also want your dudes to be moving fast so they can... Uh, position quickly and free action just screws all that completely so for that reason b tier up next holy power holy power uh, lasts for one round per level decent cast time a six will put your strength at 1800 so if you have 24 strength normally this will get dropped and you will gain uh, a buttload of thaco and one hp per level the thaco bonus is actually massive you can literally turn a cleric into a very reliable damage dealer with holy power you also are still able to cast spells, so it's not like Tensor's Transformation, where you're no longer able to cast spells or use Sequencers. You can still do that with Holy Power, but we've already talked before about why putting your Druid and Cleric in melee is dangerous. However, unlike Druid, who does get Iron Skin, Clerics actually get immunity. They get a protection from magical weapons, basically, at level 5, called a Divine Intervention. So you can combine this with Righteous Magic and Divine Intervention, and actually be fairly reliable at doing physical damage. The Thacko boost you get is massive, and you will. this will actually be useful casting as a Cleric Fighter, by the way. I don't believe this actually is useful for a Paladin. I know in some versions of the game, you get the Thacko boost when you shouldn't, even though a Paladin's Thacko at, say, level 20 is at zero. But depending on your version, you do. So you can test that and see how it goes. 1 HP per level, that's whatever. Um, if you're a decent level, that's going to be a small boost in hit points, not bad. Uh, this used to stack. Hilariously enough, you could actually cast multiple holy powers and get a buttload of HP, even though it doesn't last that long. It was still almost worth doing. And you can kind of make your uh, cleric into a juggernaut, but that doesn't work anymore, at least not in my version. So, uh, situationally useful, uh, depending on your class, depending on what your role is, depending on what you're doing, you can make some use out of this. If you are a cleric fighter, this is an A tier spell. Although you do reduce your strength to 1800, you can get around that with equipment. That is pretty painful, but. Um, if you're a pure cleric and you're using divine intervention, you can get some good use out of this. You can get some good use out of this, but it's dangerous. Got to keep that in mind. This is a very risky spell to use, but you can get some good use out of it if you are. But really, at the end of the day, though, if you're a pure cleric, you're not going to be meleeing anyway. Even if you're landing that auto attack, I mean, because you just don't have the attacks per round as a pure cleric, and that just makes this so painful. And there's really nothing you can do, right? Even if you're dual wielding, you're sitting on two attacks per round, improved taste is four, that's whatever. If you're a cleric fighter, you get a couple extra attacks around from your fighter ethos and specialization. Um, but you can't use Belm or uh, Kundane or uh, Scarlet Ninjato, and that just sucks. Because if you could, and combine that with this and Righteous Magic at 5, you could really turn into a beasty, beefy boy, but uh, you just... It's just not as good as it could be, but it's still fairly good. And again, depending on your class, you can make some good use out of this. So I'm going to leave it at uh, B tier. Uh, depending on your class, though, this could be A tier or better, however. So just keep that in mind. But you got to be careful. Sending Vicky into the front lines is dangerous. You got to watch her. You got to be very careful about that. Even if you're, uh, even if you're Animan, clerics can be very squishy. Divine intervention doesn't last very long. You got to watch that shit. You do not have the, uh, the defenses that a wizard does. So if you are using the spell, be careful, but it can be used to good effect. 
Up next, Lesser Restoration. Lesser Restoration is an A-tier spell. There's really nothing special or amazing you can use with it. All it does is basically reduce level drain and fatigue, uh, and uh, puts the fatigue uh, debuff up. Um, it restores the lost ability score points from sources such as Strength, Draining Touch, or Shadow, or uh, Mind Flayer. The thing is, this even though it has a cast time of two, if you're getting uh, your brain sucked out, you just want to get out of melee, period. You don't want to be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mind Flayers. It's just too damn risky. A couple attacks is all it takes to have your brain slurped. So using this as your oh shit, save me button is just a big mistake. You should be chugging potion potions of genius and kiting around. Although this can be used for that effect, but... Don't rely on it. Don't rely on it. For a shadow, this can be useful. That shadow uh, strength drain touch does last quite a while, so having this is useful there too. But I typically use this for when you're fighting bind or uh, vampires or you're getting level drained by the shadow dragon or something else. You'll use this shit to uh, to get rid of those uh, lost level problems there. Um, and just for that reason, it's good. It's an A tier spell. Situationally, this is absolutely mandatory. You need this spell. It's very important to have. Uh, ancient vampires, especially, will typically go invisible and rush your backline. And because your backline does not have the uh, uh, good AC, typically, because you're going to be a cleric or something, uh, you have to be very careful and you have to have this shit ready because an ancient vampire can drain you and kill you very, very quickly. So it's good to have this for that situation. It's almost mandatory, I would say. And for that reason, A tier spell. You're not going to have a bunch of these saved and memorized and used all the time, but situationally, I, I typically always have a Lesser Restoration mem memorized. Always. Because it just happens so often in Baldur's Gate 2. This is absolutely useless in PG1, but in Baldur's Gate 2, this is very important. Up next, Mental Domination. We're going to try to skip through these as quickly as possible now. Uh, Mental Domination is basically a uh, Dire Charm spell. I think it's actually on par with Domination because they get a penalty, and I don't think Dire Charm gives a penalty. Yeah, similar to those of Domination. Um... You target one creature, cast time of four, it lasts eight rounds. The fact that it only lasts eight rounds sucks. That's not very long, and they only get a minus two penalty to save. You can get this off as a cleric. Um, cleric level four spells really aren't all that great, so you can take an occasional mental domination. This spell isn't amazing, though. I have it B tier just because situationally you can make some use out of it, and it is kind of fun to play with, but for the most part, not amazing. B tier all the way. It's the same as domination. It says minor differences. This is irrelevant. This is irrelevant. You still do the exact same thing. Uh, up next is Protection from Evil, 10 foot radius, S tier all the way. And this is the reason Protection from Evil is a wizard, or the uh, level 1 version is crap. This lasts for one turn for level, way stronger, hit your whole party, excuse me, and give me each of them Protection from Evil, which is super nice, super nice. Make them immune to the effects of demons, assuming your enemies also don't have it up. Um... Because if they do, then it doesn't matter. A summon demon will do whatever. And obviously, if you're in Watcher's Keep, throwing up protection from evil, you know, it's not going to stop demons from attacking you. That's kind of a, a misnomer. But um, they still get a minus two penalty. Um, and uh, uh, what's the word? Yeah, still, still nice to have. This spell just lasts so damn long. And that it's just, it's super great. This will stack with chant, the effects of chant, prayer, defensive harmony, etc, etc. And this also doesn't affect uh, base AC. So that's something to keep in mind. A lot of people always say, well, AC can only stack up to negative 26. This doesn't affect that whatsoever. This doesn't affect that shit whatsoever. This is a penalty. So just like improved invisibility, just like a variety of other abilities, this is a penalty. So if you somehow are at the AC cap, this is actually putting you even further ahead. Allowing you to get very, very tanky even late in the game. From the beginning of when you very get the, first get this spell, the throw a ball, you want to have protection from evil 10-foot radius up at all times. And last for one turn per level, which is more than long enough to last into your next rest. Amazing. Always take it. Super good. And we got two more spells here. I think we actually got one more. There might be a good uh, spell only. Let me go double check. Recitation. This is basically another uh, chant prayer spell that you're going to be stacking. Um, lasts for one round per level, so it'll last a little bit longer. Uh, although, depending on your level. Um, uh, priest allies get two bonus to their attack rolls and saving throws, and priest enemies receive minus two to the same. They can be cast in tandem with prayer and chant. They all stack for a ridiculously powerful boost. If you cast Sequencer and throw up a recitation, a prayer, and a chant, your enemies are going to have their saving throws reduced to almost nothing, and your parties are going to be buffed to ridiculous levels. If you combine the emotion, hope, and courage on top of that, it's possible for you to get a plus 10 bonus to your saves to your whole damn party. If you throw on Mass and Viz, that's plus 15. You now cannot fail any save in the game by having all this shit combined. That is why these spells are so damn busted. Not only are you doing it for your own party, but it's a penalty for enemies too. You hit them with a the Malison, and now it doesn't matter what spell you're casting, they're going to fail their saves. Amazing spell. S tier all the way. 
This is why clerics are so much better than druids and shamans in so many ways, is because getting these spells and combining them are just absolutely devastating to have. And if you're a cleric mage, you can sequencer them to have them fire off all at once. Beyond busted. Beyond busted. Personally, I think these are a little too strong. I think they should be nerfed, but, you know, what are you going to do? Amazing. Again, it's intangible, so you're not going to see it, but holy fuck, these are ridiculously powerful. Failing Endurance. Uh, cast time of 9 targets one creature and it eliminates fatigue. How incredibly underwhelming. This is almost an RP tier spell. The reason fatigue is so devastating is because it's literally a negative luck modifier. The more the more tired you are, the less and less chance you have of getting anything off successfully and you take way more damage. So, this spell would be good, but you know what's better than casting unfailing endurance? Going to bed and taking a fucking nap. This spell blows. I have never once used it and I never will. Unless there's some additional hidden effect here that's not written that I don't know about, there's no reason to ever take that shit. I'm just going to double check to make sure there isn't a spell that is cast by uh, good clerics only. In fact, she is neutral, so I don't even get a chance to see that. It's very possible there's a good cleric spell that I'm missing here. In which case, I apologize, but I think that's it here, boys. That is going to do it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, if you disagree with me, let me know in the comments. If you think I'm a fucking moron, let me know. I love hearing about it. I love talking to you guys about spells you like, spells you don't like, whether you agree or disagree. And it's always possible I missed shit. Every single time we do one of these videos, I talk up here for an hour and a half about crap, and there's always something I miss or something that just went unnoticed from somebody who's used the spell over and over and over again. That happens. Let me know. I love talking to you guys. Let me know if you agree. Let me know if I'm a moron. Like, follow, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. You know the deal. As always, thanks for watching, my dudes. We'll see you next time. Much love and God bless.